Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Let's Make a Game. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I got a lot of a lot of response from Reddit and Discord and everything, GDL and all that, so that's great. Um, thank you guys for checking out the YouTube video as well. Um, so the point of today, oh, and also I meant to say, thank you for waiting till Sunday <laughs> instead of the Wednesday. I was it was a horrible week. Uh, luckily, I feel feel great now, much better. So. I can actually go ahead and do this. Um, so this is the only one that should be off week. Everything else should remain on the Wednesdays. Um, so uh, let me check chat real quick. Yep, hello. Um, okay, cool. So let's get started. Uh, last week, we ended off, or actually last stream was two weeks ago. Uh, we ended off with the following. This guy. So got a beautiful red biplane uh, flipped upside down, and again because of the that's because of the alpha uh, that we're adding in there, and that's what soil does to handle alpha. So we'll fix that. The point of today is we'll fix the the uh, the rotation here on the, or the flip on the Y, um, and we're gonna work on input today. So what that means is uh, we'll we'll work on setting up our classes so that we can do both mouse input and keyboard input, um, and we'll use that to move the plane around. Um, so. Let's, uh, first of all, we'll fix the rotation on the Y. Um, oh, sorry, somebody's laggy. Is that just a connection problem for you? Should be the same as before on my stream, so hopefully it's not on my side. Um, and remember, this is all being recorded as well, so if, if there are any issues or anything like that, I'll make sure to post this uh, on YouTube after uh, so that anybody, first of all, anybody that's having issues can watch it and anybody that missed the stream can also watch it um, so that they're ready for next stream. Um, so I'm hoping whoever's watching now either uh, watched the stream last time or pulled or watched the YouTube video if you didn't watch the stream um, and hopefully you pulled the code from GitHub so that we can get started with us if you're following along. Um, if not, you have time, you can go ahead and do that now. Just pull it from GitHub real quick, get it started, and then you can follow along as well um, okay so uh, let's flip let's flip the plane on the y-axis um, so we'll go into our engine folder here graphics uh, and we'll go to texture.cpp this is where we yeah this is where we set up the texture from oil uh, from soil so here what we do is we pass uh, these things in and this is the these are the flags we pass in and right now all we're doing is multiply alpha so Soil and who the developers of Soil knew that this was going to happen, so they added a flag for us that we can use. And again, this is a flag that's represented as an integer on their side, so it's bitwise or. Uh, so we always do the single pipe, and then we will add another flag. In this case, will be Soil underscore uh, flag underscore invert. There it is, invert y, um, and that'll do exactly what you think it'll do. So let's save that. Let's run it again. And there we go. The plane is flipped properly now, which is great. Uh, I think we're still setting the position to negative 100, negative 100, which is why the wheel there is cut off, and so is the side of the plane there. Um, so I guess another thing we can do today is probably scale this guy down. Um, so let's uh, let's do input first, just because that's kind of the plan for today, and then uh, if we have time, we'll we'll scale it down as, as, at the end. Um, so let's get started with input. So the way input works is uh, GLFW has specific callbacks that it can call um, when it receives input. So if you remember, if we go to our main uh, code here, uh, we have this um, engine.update. And if we go to engine.update, um, up here, we do this glfw poll events. So what this function does is it goes through all of the events that are getting added up in the queue and handles them. Um, so whether that's something that GLFW can handle natively, like dragging the window around or something like that, um, then it'll do that. And if not, it'll it'll refer or defer the code or uh, to what's called a callback, which is basically whenever it receives a specific type of input, it'll call a separate function that is meant to deal with that specific type of input. So the first thing we have to do is actually set those callbacks up. Um, so the best way to do this is to create a new folder in our engine folder here. We'll add, oops, didn't want to do that. We will add a folder and we'll call it IO, input output, which is really just going to be input, at least for now. 
um, and then we can create classes in here. So we'll create a new item, um, and we'll have a different class for each input method. So one for mouse, one for keyboard. Um, so let's start with mouse. So I'll create a header, call it mouse.h, uh, and then again, control shift A as well if you want to, just use the shortcut. Um, we'll go mouse.cpp, um, and we can get started. So again, the, what we always do is we go open def, and we'll do twitch underscore mouse, and we'll define it. Twitch underscore mouse, end if, and then we'll create our mouse class, public, and private. Perfect. Um, now, the way we're going to create this class is uh, statically. Um, the reason for that is because when you're talking about something like a mouse or a keyboard or even a joystick or any other input method, um, you don't really want to instantiate a new instance of, a, of, a, of the mouse class because there's only one mouse, right? And there's only one keyboard. And maybe, sure, you may have multiple joysticks, but there should only be one class that handles that method of input um, and, therefore, one instance of that class. Um, so it really doesn't make sense for us to instantiate mice or mouses, I guess we would call them, um, throughout our code because it, they're all really pertaining to the same thing. Um, that is globally available, for example, to Windows or Mac or whatever whatever uh, system you're on, my mouse works the same in every application. Um, it should also work the same in every aspect of our code. Um, so we're going to create this mouse class statically so that we can actually access it from anywhere without having to actually instantiate a, um, a class, and instantiate the mouse class. Um, so everything we write here is going to be static. Um, so we'll start with uh, the private variables. Um, what we're going to want here, uh, when it comes to mice, you want to know which buttons are currently down, and you want to know when they went down and when they went up. Um, so as soon as I click, you can figure out when that is on that frame. And then if you want to do something only when you first click the mouse, then you can use that. If you want to know when you release the mouse, you use that. And then if you want to know if it's currently down at all, uh, we'll use that information as well. So we'll, we'll have one for all three of these um, scenarios um, and then we'll, we'll alternate between them in our code so you can see how they work. Um, and also another big thing with the mouse is the position. Uh, so we're going to start with the position. So we'll go static and position will sort in doubles. Uh, mouse x, static double, mouse y. And really this is kind of redundant. We're already in a mouse class so I'm just going to call it x and y. x and y. Perfect. Um, and the way I'm going to store the buttons, and we'll do the same thing for the keyboard as well. The way we're going to do it is in an array of booleans. And the reason for that is because really a key is either up or down, right? It's either currently held down or not. It's either just been released or not, right? Um, so this is basically what makes the most sense is to just store it in bools, uh, in an array of bools, um, and then we can access the data in that, in that sense. Um, so we'll create our three arrays, so static bool, and we'll have buttons, so these are the, the mouse buttons, and we'll be in an array there, and we'll do static bool buttons down, and static bool buttons up. So if I want to know if the mouse is currently held down, I'll read buttons. If I want to know if I just clicked a, a button on the mouse, I'll read buttons down. And if I want to know if I just released one, I'll read buttons up. So basically for the left mouse button, this index, uh, this array at the left mouse button's index will be true during the frame in which I release the mouse. And that way we can do things only once as soon as you click or as soon as you release. Or if we want to do something ongoing, we'll just read if it's currently down on the frame. And you'll see how that works when we get to actually implementing that. So. Um, okay, great. So we have our, uh, where we're storing our data. Now the way GLFW works again is using callbacks. So we need to set up the functions that, that GLFW is going to defer that, um, that event to. Um, and it'll pass us some information. Uh, so if it's going to be GLFW, uh, we're going to need to include GLFW3. Perfect. So now we can actually call these callbacks. And now these two functions that I'm about to write, they need to be written exactly the same. Uh, the reason for that is because the callback needs to have a very specific um, uh, prototype. So it needs to have a very specific, it needs to take uh, a window and two doubles for the mouse position and a window and three ints for the button position. So these have to be exactly as I'm writing them. And obviously the static, you don't have to have the static, but again, because we're doing our statically, we're going to create a static, static as well. 
Um, so static void, and it has to be called mount mouse pause callback. Um, now actually, it doesn't have to be called. We can call it whatever we want, but these are what matters. The what the arguments that are getting pulled in. So it's going to pull in a glfw window pointer called window. It's going to call, uh, pull in a double called x, and because we already have something called x in our privates, uh, you should just do underscore x, and we'll have double underscore y. Okay, so there's our position callback. So you will get glfw to call this function whenever the mouse position changes. And when it receives that event, it'll call this, and then we can up update our data that's available. And then somewhere else in the code, we'll access the data on the same frame and see what the status of the mouse is. Um, so the next one is, so this is for the position, x and y, and then we have one for the buttons. So we'll go static void mouse buttons. I'll just go button button callback. Uh, and again, glfw window. Oops, window. Oh, window pointer called window. Um, and then it's going to take three things. So one is going to be an integer representation of the button that was pressed. Um, and glfw has these all saved for us, so it, we don't really need to know what they are because we can just use their enums. Um, but it is as an int. So we'll pull in an int button, uh, int action, and the action is going to tell us whether it was pressed down or released or, or nothing. Right, we'll, we'll see how that works. And then int mods, which are like modifiers, um, which we probably don't care about. Um, uh, so that's it. So those are our two callback functions. Um, now, again, because we're creating a static class, we don't, and these are private, we need to get, we need to do some sort of, we need to have smart getters, really. Because we don't want to say mouse at but, uh, dot buttons at whatever. Um, we want to actually just be able to call uh, functions and methods on this class uh, that, that, again, can be called statically and will give us the data we want. Um, so the first two are obvious, so we'll do static get mouse x. Oops, and we don't want to write code in there. Um, oh, and that's going to return a double. And then static double get mouse y. So those are too easy, and all they're going to do is return the x and the y. Um, and then we'll have three more for the other three states. So we'll have static bool buttons, and actually we'll call it um, button down. And we'll ask for the button. So tell us which button you want to know about. So we'll, say, we'll ask for, we'll have button down, button up, and uh, this one is kind of going to be, it's, it's button pressed, or button press. Um, I'm just going to call it button. Um, basically the way I see it is, get me the state of the button I'm passing in if the button for the button that was down. So it's like, was the left mouse button down? This will return true or false. Was the left mouse button just released, true or false? And just give me the status of this button. So it'll be either true or false, whether it's currently up or down. Um, now again, the events that come into GLFW are either released or pressed. Um, so we are going to do some, some magic to determine if it's still down. And really, all that's going to do is as soon as you call down, or as soon as we get the, the event of the button being down with the action, we'll just set the buttons to true. And then when it's released, we'll set it to false. Um, so that should be it for our function. So let's save that and we'll switch over to mouse.cpp. Um, and here's where we're actually going to use uh, the data we get from the callbacks and where we're actually going to set up our, our um, static private data. Um, so the first thing we do is include mouse. Um, and because we have static data, uh, we need to initialize it here now before, like outside of, of any function or anything like that, because that's how statics work. Um, so we have two doubles, and they're part of the mouse class. So it's mouse and it's uh, x, and we'll just initialize this as zero, and double mouse y equals zero as well. And then we have three bools, three boolean arrays. So mouse, what was it called? Buttons. Um, okay, yeah, buttons. And now, well, because we're initializing it here, we need to give it an actual size. Um, now, the beauty of GLFW is that it has a lot of data about its all the buttons, all the keys, and keyboard, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and because they're enums, they tend to have a number, or a last at the end, um, which will tell us how many buttons uh, GLFW can, can handle in a mouse. Um, and that we can access by GLFW underscore button, or sorry, mouse, mouse underscore button. So you can see that it handles eight buttons. And here's last. So last will tell me, will give me eight. As you can see, it's defined as eight. So we can go 
from 1 to 8. So we go last so that we know exactly how many. So that, for example, if, if GLW upgrades and they add support for 12 buttons, last will now be 12, so we can actually continue to use this code properly instead of just hard coding it to number 8. Um, so we'll give it that many buttons, and we'll initialize them all to 0. That's false. Oops, and these should be equals. Um, and then we'll do the same thing for buttons down and buttons up, which is what they call them. Okay, so now we've initialized our static data. So now we can actually start implementing our methods. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is our void mouse, um, mouse pause callback. And again, it takes a glfw window pointer to window and then two doubles, underscore x and underscore y. Um, okay, great. So what I want to do here is we're getting an x and a y. So we can easily just say x equals underscore x and y equals underscore y. Um, now, glfw windows work with the 0, 0 coming from the top left of the screen. And if you remember from last time, we set up our viewport for, for OpenGL to start at the bottom left of the screen. So when we get a y of 10 from this callback, it's going to be, it, it actually means the top left of the window down 10 to, down 10 pixels on the Y. Um, but for us in GL, OpenGL, that's going to mean 10 up from the bottom of the window. So we do actually need to convert this Y. Um, so to do that, what we're going to do is first get the frame buffer size that we set up. And if you remember, we did this before. Um, so we're going to have a width and height. Whoops. And height. And then we'll call glfw get frame buffer size. And if you remember, we do have a window pointer, which is perfect. So we pass that in, and then we'll give it uh, a, again. It wants a pointer to a width, uh, to an int for width, and a pointer to an int for y. So we'll give it references to our width and height. So now at this point, width and height are equal to our actual frame buffer width and height. And now the width doesn't actually matter. We don't care, um, but the y does. So I'm going to set y equal to the height minus the actual y we get passed in. So this way we'll actually be able to convert it properly. So if our mouse is at the top left of the screen down by 10 pixels, we'll actually get our height of the screen minus 10, which is in our in the proper uh, way we're handling x and y in our OpenGL buffer. Um, so that is our position callback. That should be good. Uh, so we can set up the buttons one now. So void mouse, and we called it mouse button callback down here. And again, it takes a glfw window pointer, call window, uh, and it takes three ints, so the button itself, the action, and these mods. Okay, um, so now the way we're going to write this button code is going to be actually extremely similar, if not exactly the same, as the way we're going to handle our keyboard buttons because our keyboard buttons are just buttons and we're going to handle them the exact same way because GLFW handles those buttons the exact same way. Um, so what we're going to do here is first, I want to make sure button is a, a, a valid value. Um, so if button is less than zero, just return. Um, and yes, you can add your brackets there for something this simple, I, I don't mind. Um, so now we can actually check the action, right? Because we need to know, okay, sure, we know which button something happened to, but we need to know what happened. Did it get released? Did it get, pre uh, did it get pressed? What happened to it? So we'll check the action. So if the action, um, so we're going to do this. How do we do this? I think we're going to do this a little backwards here. Um, we're going to check if the action was not glfw release, because we don't care about any other actions. We only care about release and um, not released. Okay. So if it wasn't released, um, and the button um, in our array is equal to false, then we're going to actually set up both the buttons up and buttons down. So remember, I said once we receive that release or not, or anything but a release, which is, uh, I think it's glfw underscore press. Yeah, press. Um, but we're going to do it this way. It's not equal to release. Um, so if we're not getting a release action, then any other action with, with for a button is only going to be pressed. Um, and the button in our array is not is actually equal to false, meaning it's not pressed yet. We're going to say that buttons down is true. Oh, sorry, buttons down a button 
is equal to true, and buttons down at, uh, sorry, buttons up, oh geez, at button is equal to false. Because, okay, we just clicked our button, because we didn't release it, so we pressed it, and it was it was already not, it was set to not press, so we have to update um, the buttons down to press and the buttons up to false. Okay, so buttons down true, buttons up false. So we just pressed it, um, and then we're gonna do the same thing, but this time if it is equal to release, um, and we're gonna check if it's true, right? So if we did just release it and our button is set to true, and and then remember this is our buttons array, which we're gonna update at the end of this. We just have to make sure that these are in the correct state based on what, what event just happened. So in this case, uh, our buttons down is going to be false, and our buttons up is going to be true because we just pressed it, or sorry, we just released it. Uh, so we just up on that button. And then we can actually up, update our buttons. So buttons that button um, equals the action if it wasn't glfw underscore release. So again, we're going to use the same way we did it here. And this is just to be uh, uh, to be the, to do the same thing really when we're doing these both both of these checks. So again, this is just going to be either true or false based on whether the action was not GLFW release. So if the, if it was GLFW release, then this was going to be false, which means this is going to be false, which means our buttons array that is maintaining the current state of our buttons is going to be false. If it if it was released, then it's going to be or sorry, if it wasn't released, it's going to be true. If it was released, it's going to be false. Um, so that's going to be how we handle our buttons. And again, we're going to do the keyboard in the exact same way. And then at the end um, of, actually, that is the end. I think that's all we got to do. Because now we have our down, our up arrays are updated properly, and our buttons arrays also updated properly. Uh, so now we just need our getters. Um, so void, actually, we do double for positions, right? So mouse, get mouse x, and we'll just return. Um, X. And we'll do the same here. Mouse get mouse Y. Oops. Oh, jeez. Return Y. Perfect. And they they get updated here. Remember that, right? Um, and now we'll actually get so whether the mouse was just pressed or released or not. Um, so the reason we do this here is because as soon as we get another event, we need to update these, even if we haven't read read their, their state yet. Okay. Now, we're not, I don't think we're guaranteed to um, know about an event in the same frame. Um, I don't, not exactly sure how GLFW works at the very low level, but we're going to make it, we're going to write the code in such a way that doesn't really matter. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to return bool for mouse button down and give it a button. So we're going to ask, okay, is the button that I'm passing in, currently down. So remember, we have a we have an array for that buttons down, right? Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is um, cache what's in buttons down into a new bool. So bool x equals buttons down at button because this is going to be either this is going to be whatever our state is, true or false, right? But before I return, now that I've read it because this is something that happens in it the only happens once. You you should only ever be handling one button down because you can't have but buttons down multiple times over the course of certain frames, right? Because you only press it down in one frame. And you can't press it down again until you press it up, right? Until you release it. Um, so we'll cache that and then we have to update this because now that we read it, again, if we're if we're not getting in the same frame, we don't want this to get to get blown away by anything else. So we want to maintain it, unless obviously we get a different a different uh, action here. We want to maintain it. And then on the, once we read it, then we can go ahead and clear it. So we'll set that equal to false. And then we'll return x. So this way, it doesn't matter if it takes one or two frames for us to get the for us to be able to call this and and get the the state of our button, um, because this way we'll maintain it until we read it. And as soon as we read it, because this can only happen once, um, at least per frame, then we'll we'll ca we'll cache it, we'll reset it, and then we'll return it. And then on the next down, so something here, uh, we'll set that back equal to true. Okay. So we're gonna do the same for button up. And this will be buttons up, and then buttons up equal, oops, buttons up equal false, and then we'll return x again. Um, and then we have one more, so bool mouse oops, button into button. And for this one, because we're not, we don't have to 
handle any of this because we're just asking about the current state of the button. Uh, we can just return buttons at button directly because that does uh, get updated here. And this is not asking, did it just get pressed or did it just get released? It's just asking, what is the current state of our button? Which is why this can be handled a little simpler. Um, okay, I think that's it for our mouse. So let's um, go back into engine, or sorry, into Twitch. There we go. And let's use it. Um, so let's first, we have to include it. So we'll include engine IO mouse. And now, we, again, we don't have to instantiate it. It's a totally static class. Um, oh, one thing actually we do have to do is go back into our engine because remember those callbacks I was talking about? Um, we need to actually tell GLFW what those callbacks are. Um, so we'll do that here in the GLFW setup. Um, we can do it right after we, uh, we'll do it right here. Before we set up the window, after we set up the context. Um, so here we can set the callback. So GLFW set. Um, and for this one, we'll do cursor, I think, cursor, yep, cursor pause callback. So you can set the position directly, but we want to set up the callback so that every time a position, a cursor position event is uh, is pulled, it'll call on a callback with the data. So we'll set it to, and now at this point, we actually have to include our mouse.h in the engine itself. Um, so we actually don't need it there. We just need it here. So we will do include, io mouse.h perfect and now we can do again it's all static and in this case we need it to be static because we uh we need to give it this function callback um so we'll pass in the window and we'll pass in mouse and again because it's static we can just call whatever function we want on it in this case we want to give it the function pointer to our mouse pause callback and that's it that's setting up the position callback and now we'll set up the cursor uh what is it set cursor oh maybe it's not cursor mouse there it is mouse button any one of them was different so set mouse button callback and set cursor pause callback and in this case you'll see it doesn't like it because it's telling you right there so that is the prototype for my function that i'm trying to assign it to but it's not valid because it's incompatible with that parameter type mouse button fun um it's basically saying that your prototype for the function you're trying to pass in is not valid. Um, and you can get what it expects from GLFW just from the wiki. You can see what the callback expects. You can set up your function that way. Um, in this case, it'll be mouse button callback. And you'll see that it likes that just fine. So now, anytime we pull our events, so again, we won't get that, we won't get this data updated until we call our update in our engine, which is fine. So every time we pull events, we'll get new mouse data. And that will call our mouse class, which will update the local variables properly, which then we can uh, receive and, and use given these getters. Um, so now we can go to Twitch, and now we can actually use it. So uh, you'll see engine.update. Everything's already set up. It's going to pull our events, and it's going to call those callbacks. So I can actually update things right now. Um, so for now, what we can do is Sprite has a position, right? Yes, we gave it a position, but we gave it no method of changing the position. So we're going to add a position to our Sprite. And again, I'm doing this in the Sprite, not in the texture, because the texture only handles the GLF, uh, so the OpenGL texture and its data. Sprite is what uses, what displays the texture at a certain location, at a certain rotation, whatever we want to do. Um, so in this case, we'll update the position. So let's do um, void. Uh, set pause and we'll give it float x float y um, and we can also do like add a pause or sub pause or whatever uh, we'll just pass in the x and the y there and then we'll create that down here so void sprite set pause and it'll take float x float y and I realize that we're converting doubles to floats um, I think the I think the mouse callback wants doubles so we'll have to just uh, convert it here um, so we're, we'll, we'll receive the x and y as floats, so we can just say x pause equals x, y pause equals y, and that should be enough to update our position, so our next render call will use that x pause and y pause to, to translate to. So that's it, all we got to do is set that, um, and then when we actually call that function, we can do that in here. So we'll update everything, um, and then we'll do, so before we render, after we update, because this is still technically an update, uh, we'll do test sprite dot set pause and we'll get the x and the y from the mouse mouse um, class so we have to first of all we're gonna lose um, 
supposition here. So we're going to pass these to floats. And we're going to call mouse. And again, it's static. We just do call the, the mouse class, colon, colon. And we'll say get mouse x. And then again, convert to a float. And we'll call mouse get mouse y. Uh, there we go, and now we should be updating the position of our sprite given our x and y position of the mouse, and that should be enough. So let me try that, and if I start with my, I got some warnings there, uh, mouse out of here, you can see it's not getting any events, and as soon as I move it, the biplane should move, and there it is. So the biplane is now moving with our x and y, and as you can tell, I mean, you can obviously tell that the X and Y of the sprite itself is at the bottom left. And I think we did that on purpose last week or last time just to, uh, for simplicity's sake. So we can, we can change that. We can update that. Um, but there we go. We're getting our callbacks, our data is getting passed along properly. Um, and we can move the sprite around. Um, so before we continue, I'm just going to check comments to make sure everyone's good. And yeah, it looks like everyone is good so far. No comments. So just here, shout, give me a shout if you, having issues or if you don't understand something I'll help you out. Um, okay, so we're moving the biplane around with our mouse. First point of input. Awesome. So uh, now we have buttons. We don't really have a way to test them, right? So um, maybe what we can do... Um, okay, here, let's, let's, let's add some functionality to our buttons. Um, so let's close this. For uh, right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do... Um, okay, let's add a rotation to our sprite. Um, that should be very simple. So everything's already set up for it. So all we want to do is add a new float for rotation, call it rot, and we'll have a void set rot, and we'll take one float, uh, the value of the rotation. Um, and because we're 2D, we're going to assume all the rotations are on the z-axis, which is what sticks out of your out of your um, out of your monitor. Um, so we'll set the rotation. Very simple. Up here, we'll have to say rod equals zero. We'll do that for all of them. Um, we don't have to create a new one for these. We just that's fine. I don't think we need a new constructor for rotation. Um, so we'll have a new void sprite set rot float uh, x and rot equals x. Perfect. And what we can do here is so again I, I talked about this before, right? We translate, then we rotate, then we scale. Um, so let's actually add some rotation code here. So it's very simple. Again, GL rotate F, and we'll pass in the angle. So that's a rot. And then these three next floats are the axes that we're rotating about. Um, so again, nothing on the X and nothing on the Y because we're, we're in two dimensions. So we're only going to rotate about the Z axis, which is what sticks out of your monitor. So it'll rotate about that axis, um, and that should rotate the way we expect in a 2D game. Um, so we'll give it a 1, and that's it. That should be everything we need. Um, so to test this quickly, in the update method, because again, we call update, right? We call update in our in our main program here, uh, test sprite.update. So in our update, we're just going to say rot plus plus. And that's going to be really fast, I think. Uh, but for now, we'll just, just to, I just want to see it rotate properly. Um, so let's run that. And there it is. It's rotating. So every... Every frame, it's adding plus one degree to our rotation, and it's rotating the plane. So that was easy, right? Um, again, rotating about that bottom left point there. Um, we'll fix that. We can do that now, actually, too, just, just to make it easier to see. Uh, also, scaling would be nice. Um, so why don't we add that now, actually? Um, because you saw how easy rotation was, we can add scaling just the same way. Um, so let's add uh, new floats. Float uh, scale, let's say x scale, float y scale, because you can scale it uh, non proportionally if you want. Um, and then we'll call void set scale. Um, and generally, because our scale is it's kind of like a percentage, right? If you go 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it'll be half and half on, on, on both sides. Um, but we'll, so we'll do two set scales. We'll do float x, um, and we'll do void set scale. Uh, float x, float y. So that this way we give it, we have the option of just doing it proportionally or non-proportionally, and so that we don't have to write the same value in twice. Um, so we'll go down here, and then add it. So void sprite set uh, scale, 
equals x, and we'll say x scale equals x, y scale equals x, and we'll go void sprite, set scale, float x, float y, x scale equals x, whoops, x, y scale equals y. So that should set up our scaling properly. So in this case, we only take one value, so we do it proportionally, and this allows us to not do it proportionally if we want to. Um, and so up here, again, translate, rotate, then we scale. So there we go. The third one is, you guessed it, GL scale F. Oops, GL scale F. And it'll take an X, a Y, and a Z. So we want to scale on the X and the Y. Again, you don't really scale on the Z in two dimensions because you're not going to see a difference because it's, that's again, the, the Z axis is what sticks out of your monitor. So if it gets bigger or smaller along that axis, you're not going to notice it. It's 2D. So we'll do X scale and the Y scale and zero. So we'll scale it. Um, actually, zero, I think it just actually needs to be a one um, because we want to set the scale to one. One is 100%. If we set it to zero, it might be like a zero. I'm not quite sure what will happen. Um, but the point is we have our X scale and our Y scale here. So now um, I'm not going to change the scale on the update method at all, but uh, we can go to Twitch. And when we set up our sprites here, we can say test sprite.setScale. We'll say 0.25F. Whoa, not that. 0.25F. So a quarter of the size. And if we run it, we'll see, hopefully, it's a smaller plane. There we go. So now, done. Scaling is easy. Again, it's all built into OpenGL. So this is why we're using the, the, the library and the framework. It's, it's an incredible piece of technology. And as you can see, now we've got a cool scale uh, rotating about the bottom left of the image. And it's scaled down to a quarter of the size. Looks pretty sweet. So now, the reason I added these, so these are simple to add, uh, again, but what I want to do now is actually use the buttons for something. Um, so let's take that rotation code um, out of, oops, sorry, sprite. Take the rotation code out of the update. Um, and what I want to do is left button will rotate it to the left in the, or in, in the positive direction, which is looks like it's going to be towards the left um, by, let's say, 45 degrees or 10 degrees or whatever. And the right, the right mouse button will rotate it in the opposite direction. Um, so set rot is setting the absolute value of the rotation. So it's an absolute thing. Um, we want, I'm fairly sure, we're going to want to add the ability to do it relatively. So instead of set rot, uh, well, what we can do is do set rot 2 and set rot by. So set rot two is going to absolutely set the rotation to the x. Set rot by is going to relatively set the rotation to the x, which is really just a fancy way of saying it's going to add x to it. Um, and then we can pass in a positive value or a negative value to rotate in that particular direction. Um, so let's go over here, and this will be set rot two, and then we'll say void sprite set rot by float x rot plus equals x. Simple. Done. So now we can actually set the rotation by and rotation starts at zero so we can add to it to rotate to the left or subtract to it to rotate to the right. To the right. Um, so if we go back to Twitch, what we can do here is we set the position, that's fine, and then we can check here. So if, uh, and again we can call our mouse just like this, mouse, and then a get button down. So I want to know if the button just got pressed. So only once, as soon as I click, um, for the left mouse button. So that's what I'm going to pass in. And again, GLFW has this for us. So GLFW underscore button underscore one is the left mouse button. Oh, sorry, mouse button one is the left mouse button. So if left mouse button was just pressed, then we're going to say test sprite dot rotate by, or I guess that's set rot by. That's, we could probably rename those. Um, let's call it uh, 10 degrees. And um, that's if we press the left mouse button, and if we press the right mouse, actually there's zero. Oh, there's zero. Okay, so the right mouse button must be number two, unless that's the middle mouse button. We can check. Um, oh, actually, I think it GLFW underscore mouse underscore button underscore right. Yeah, there we go. That's better. Oh, we don't have to guess. Underscore left. So that's easier. So left mouse button rotates by ten. Right mouse button rotates by negative ten. Um, and again, we set the position, we'll update the rotation, and then we'll see that rotation next time we render. So let's run that, and let's play around with this plane so we can see it. I'm going to click left click. Look at that, rotating by 10 degrees. 
every time I click. And only as soon as I click, I, I'm holding it down right now and it only moved once because it's only as soon as we click. And then I can let go. As soon as I click, there it goes. And then I can do right mouse button and it goes the other way. So you can see it's it's working. Um, what I want to do is make sure that the other one works. So let's do if mouse button instead of oh actually let's let's yeah let's do our three functions here. So up. So when I when I when I as soon as I push the left mouse button, it'll rotate to the left by ten. As soon as I release the right mouse button, so I have to press it and then I have to release it. And once I release it, then it'll move to the right. And then um, we'll see. Um, if the mouse button, yeah, and we'll do the middle mouse button. So GLFW, mouse button, uh, middle, yep. So if the middle mouse button is currently pressed, and you'll see what I mean by this, it's not as soon as I press it is, is it still pressed in this frame? And if that is the case, then we'll move it, let's just say to the left again, by 10. And uh, now we can test all three of our mouse functions. Obviously our, oops, obviously our X and Y function work properly, and then our, we can test these three. So mouse button down, mouse button up, and mouse button. So you can see nothing's happening. As soon as I press the left mouse button, it goes left to by 10, and then I can release it, nothing happens. Now I'm going to press the right mouse button, nothing happens. I'm going to release, and it moves to the right by 10. Perfect. And now I'm going to push the middle mouse button, and I'm going to hold it pressed. And you can see that's exactly what I meant. So either it was pressed, either it was released, or either it is currently down. And if it is currently down, then it spins. And as soon as I release, it just stops spinning. That's perfect. So I can go, Ooh. that's pretty cool. Um, there we go. So that is uh, rotation. Those are our buttons. Those are our mouse inputs. Totally working. That's excellent. So now we're going to do our keyboard. And our keyboard is going to be very simple because it's basically just the button section of our mouse. Uh, so. Let's get started. First, I guess I'll check key, uh, comments again. It looks like everyone's good, so let's keep going. Um, so I'll add um, the keyboard class. So Control Shift A. We'll go keyboard dot H and keyboard dot CVP. Perfect. And then I'm going to close the mouse ones now. It's getting a little big. Sprite's fine. Texture's not good because we don't care about that anymore. All right, great. So again, if and def twitch underscore keyboard, then define twitch underscore keyboard, and if, oops, um, and while the class keyboard public private, and we know we're going to need GLFW's uh, GLFW3. Okay, perfect. Now this is going to look again exactly the same or very similar to our mouse class. So we'll start with the privates again and again it's just going to be those three static, there's no positioning in keyboards, it's just buttons. So static keys, um, or I can call them buttons, these are keys. Um, static keys down and static keys, oh why is that so small? I've never seen that before, it's weird. Anyways, um, static keys Oh. oh, and <laughs> yeah, make sure these are all booleans. Perfect. So now we have proper boolean arrays, keys, keys down, and keys up. And we're going to need our callback and our three getters. So our callback is looks like this static void key callback. Um, and it'll take glfw window, glfw window pointer called window. And it'll take int key, int scan code, int action, and int mods. And this one you can see has scan code as opposed to the mouse one, uh, which is fine. Um, and then we'll have our getter. So static pool key down, and then int key. Same idea, right? Then key static pool key up, and static pool key. So we'll get the current state of that button, whether it was pushed down or not, pushed up or pushed, or is currently pushed. Um, so those are our three. That, that's it, I think. Yes, yeah, all we got. So let's go keyboard, include keyboard. Um, and the first thing we do is the callback. Or actually, no, sorry, we have the static variables, right? So we have these, these are all static. Again, statically defined class. So we'll, uh, we'll set these up. 
first. So static keys, um, and we'll give it a or, yeah again keyboard keys. Uh, there we go, um, and we'll give it a size. So again, glfw underscore key underscore last. As you can see, perfect key underscore last. Um, that'll give us the right size, and we'll initialize them all to zero, which is false. Oh geez, I keep forgetting these for some reason today. Static bool array. Oh yeah, not static, just bool. There we go. Sorry guys. Um, so we have keys, keys down, and keys up. And again, they're all going to be the same size, obviously. Um, then we'll have our void keyboard uh, key callback function. GLFW window pointer called window int key int scan code int action and int mods. Perfect. Key scan code action mods. So again, check if the key is valid. So if key is less than zero, uh, just return because we don't want to handle anything that's not valid. So if the action is not GLFW underscore release, and yes, we use the same thing. So it, literally very similar to our mouse code um, and again our keys key is false then we'll say keys down um, at key equals uh, what is it here true and keys up at key equals false so we didn't just release it so we must have pressed it uh, so keys down goes true and keys up goes false That's correct then if action equals glfw uh, release and our key was pressed, last state was pressed, then we'll say keys down at key equals false and keys up at key equals true. Perfect. Um, and then we set up our keys. So keys at key equals, and again, action not equal to glfw release. Perfect. So again, exactly the same as our mouse code. It's the same thing. And then we'll get it. We'll do a getter. So again, uh, we have to handle the special case here. So we'll keyboard um, key down, and we'll pass in the key. And we'll again, cache that. So we'll x equals um, keys down at key. Uh, keys down at key equals false and then return x. Simple. Then we'll do the same with our up key up and keys up. Keys up. Perfect. Uh, and again, so our is the key currently up? Cache it, x equals keys up at key. Keys up a key equals false, and then we return the x. And then finally, bool keyboard key and key, and we'll just return whatever that is in our array. So keys at key and semicolon. Perfect. So very similar to mouse, should be good to go. Um, again, we have to go to our engine and set up that callback. Um, so that callback looks very similar to our callbacks here. So we'll do um glfw set key there we go set key callback um and again we need to include uh, io keyboard um and we'll set the key callback we'll pass the window and we'll say mouse oh sorry key board uh key callback and as you can see it will not complain about the prototype there we look we're all good to go and that's it's as simple as that that's it now we can go into our twitch again and set up some keyboard stuff so okay we, we have the, the position that's fine um, let's make it um, let's give it like a WASD style movement so let's remove this or at least comment it out uh, we'll keep the button press stuff and now we can check if keyboard um, oh and we have to include it Oh jeez. There we go. If keyboard, there we go. So keyboard. Uh, we can get key. So we don't want to know because 
we don't want it to start move, only move as soon as we press or as soon as we release. We want to know the actual state. So while it's down, we'll be moving it. So if keyboard uh, key, and we'll give it glfw underscore key underscore uh, w. So that's how we handle the w key. And if w is pressed, then we'll just say, oh, in this case, we're going to need our sprite. Oh, jeez. We need to move our sprite uh, relatively as well. So set pause to. And um, you know what? Let's rename these because I don't like the name of these. This is going to be move to. This will be rotate to. This will be. Oh, I guess we can do this in a slightly smarter way. Uh, we'll right click and rename so it changes in the other file. So move to. Yep, apply. Then this will be rotate to. Uh, skip preview. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just apply it. And rotate. So rotate by. Okay, and then the set scale is fine. We, well, yeah, we'll want, we might want to scale um, during our game dynamically. Um, I think we're fine for now. So we'll do move to, and we'll do void move by. Float x, float y. Perfect. Uh, so now that we can move relatively, then we probably want a sense of speed, right? Um, so let's give it a speed, float speed. And then we're also going to have to set speed, right? Void set speed, float x. Perfect. Um, now, yeah, I realize if we want to increase the speed by 5 when you get a power up or something, we're gonna probably going to want a, a relative as well. So set speed. Uh, so uh, how do we call it now? <laughs> speed to and speed by. Set speed to or change speed to. I guess we do change speed to and change speed by. Oh, I don't like that. Let's call it. That's fine. Let's just call it speed to and speed by. Um, yeah, we'll know what I mean. That's fine. Um, okay, so let's go over here. So we need to add a move by function and the speed to and speed by. Um, so we have uh, move to, rotate, uh, here we go. So move to, we need move by. So void sprite, move by, float x, float y, and then x pause plus equals x, and y pause plus equals y. Oh, geez, plus equals y. Perfect. Um, we could also do it so that we pass in a bool and say, is relative, yes or no? And then we'll either add them or set them to. Um, I think this is fine. I think this works. And I think it's more clear. Uh, so move to, move by, and then we need to speed one. So void sprite, uh, speed to, float x, uh, speed equals x, void sprite, speed by, float x, speed plus equals x. Um, now I'm thinking about it now, we probably never want to add an absolute value to it, relatively speaking. We probably just want to say is have half of the originals. We probably want to do more of like a ratio or a percentage, um, but that's fine. I mean, if we get to that intricate as we go along, we can come back and change that. Um, so for now, we'll keep everything the same like this. So we have speed two and speed by. We'll set the original speed of this. We can say speed equals something like five, I guess. Five is a good number, right? Well, it all depends actually, because now we're talking about like delta time when it comes to updates, right? Um, and we won't get into that in this video, but we'll we'll update this properly so that it's it's it works with delta time. And you'll see. You, I'll explain all that next time. Um, for now, we have a speed, and uh, we need to move by. Yeah, I guess so, move by. Because if we have a speed, I guess we could, well, for now, what we can do is just return the speed so we can actually get it out. But really, if we have a speed, we, we shouldn't give it an X and a Y to move by. We should just say move left, and it should move left by the speed amount, right? Um, or maybe we have both, because actually, yeah, but if we move left, yeah, we can move left and up at the same time, at the same speed. I think that's fine. Um, yeah, okay. So let's let's do that. So we'll have move to, move by, and then we'll have our directional. So void move left, um, uh, void move right, void move up, 
and void move down. And then we'll set these up because we have a speed that makes sense, right? Void sprites move uh, left. And we'll just say xbos minus equals speed. Left, right, up, down. Oops. Move left, right. We'll add the speed. Move up. We'll do the y pause. Minus, you know, plus equals because our, our bottom is zero. And then move down. We'll say y pause minus equals speed. Okay, so we have directionals, that's fine. Um, so now, because our sprite can handle that, we can actually go back to Twitch and. Oh, right, we renamed these. Oh, uh, what? I thought. Yeah, well, whatever. Rotate by, right? Rotate by, rotate by. Um, and, okay, so if you press up, we're going to say test sprite dot move up. Simple. Up, down, left, right. Um, and that'll be W. Oh, it's not an order, but that's fine. Up, down, left, right. Oops. Okay, so now we should be able to move our sprite by a speed. The speed is initially set to 5, so we should be good to go here. Um, and this will be as, as it's pressed. So it doesn't matter when I release or when I press or whatever. Okay, so it starts at 0, 0. That's fine. Is that 0, 0? Was it cut off? Um... Oh no, it starts at negative 100, negative 100, we need to change that. So let's let's update that, because I wanted to start at 0, 0. Uh, so we'll stop, start again. Uh, there we go, 0, 0, and then I'm holding D, W, A, and S. And if I hold two at the same time, it does that. If I hold, because we're not else if, else if checking, uh, if I hold both A and D at the same time, this should cancel out and remain static. As soon as I release A, it'll move to the right. Hold them down again, release D, and move to the left, and yeah, there we go. So now we have it based on the current state of the keyboard um, at that particular frame. Now, the, re the thing I was talking about earlier about delta time, um, right now, this is, this is what speed 5 looks like on my computer. Um, if you have a slower machine or a faster machine uh, where the frames can get called faster, basically, you can iterate through that our while loop faster than I can then you will move your plane faster than I will. Um, and it matters because if you want your game to be able to be played on like, you know, lower end machines, um, you don't want them to actually be able to move slower, right? Generally what would happen is given a delta time, we'll multiply that delta time by our speed. And yeah, our speed is going to have to increase like a lot. Like for to get the same movement here with delta time, it'd probably be like 100 or I don't know, some value. But it'll be the same on all machines because Based on the de delta time is how mu how long it how much time spent uh, going from one frame to the other. So one frame might take a lot longer to render than another. Uh, delta time would help ensure that you're still moving at the rate that the player expects. Um, so yeah, right now if I was to hold right and then I had a big lag and then I the the lag was over, I would only be moving another five instead of where I expect to be at that point because I was holding it down the whole time. So we'll take delta time multiplied by our, by our speed and then that'll give us a resulting speed given that that is relative to how long that frame took. Anyways, the whole point is that it moves um, in a cost, at a constant way. Um, and you know what? Like that's so easy to implement too. We could probably do it right now as well. Um, we, I mean, yeah, I know we're, it's eight o'clock. We're almost done here, but or eight o'clock where I am anyways. Um, but let's, yeah, let's implement it real quick. It, it's fast. It's, it's simple. Um, so we'll go to our engine, um, and our engine is what handles our frames, right? So we basically need to use our engine to determine how long our frame took. Um, so we can say engine.h, and we have window. Now we, and it's a static window, right? I mean, it's private. We can access it from anywhere, but it's private. Uh, we don't expose it anywhere. But what we can do is expose um, our delta time somewhere, right? Um, so what we can do is we'll create our static, I don't know why I put it there, uh, we'll do static um, dt, delta time, um, and it'll be a double, I guess, I think double, I think jailhouse, ah, it's fine, double. 
Um, so, and, and the reason I make it static here is because I don't want to have to instantiate a new engine just to check the delta time, right? It doesn't make any sense. There's only one engine. Really, this should be a singleton, which is, you know, where you can only instantiate one of them at the same time um, or at any given time. Um, and here, um, we'll have a static double so that we can return it statically, just like these guys, right? But, I mean, we could do it that way. No, but I do calculations on this, whereas these don't change. Um, so we'll get a get, we'll create a getter for it. And actually, I guess we do that right now. Um, so we'll do um, static double get delta time. Perfect. And we'll actually use that to get the del delta time uh, for that frame. So because we have dt statically, we need to go up to the top, just like our other stuff, from dt equals zero, uh, just to start uh, <laughs> double engine dt equals zero. There we go. Um, okay, great. And now what we can do is in our update, see we're, we're polling right now, our update gets called at the, or should get called anyways, at the start of our while loop, which it does, right? So right here. So this is the point where our frame starts, right? Because this all happens before we even start looping, right? This is our game loop. This is where our frame starts. First thing that gets called when our frame starts should be engine.update. Um, so here is what we'll do a calculation, which makes the most sense. Um, so what I'll do is, um, Basically, again, it's just, it's like I said before, right? It's just a, it's a, the difference in time um, that, or sorry, in the time that it took to uh, for our um, frame to render and for everything to go through. Basically, how long it took for us to go through this entire uh, while loop once. Um, so to do that, we're just gonna subtract, right? So um, now we actually need to keep track of another thing: um, the last time. Uh, because we need to, we, again, it's difference, it's an ongoing difference as we're going through frame, from frame by frame. Um, so we'll just do another a double here, and it's not static because we don't need to access it statically. Just a double, we'll call it last time. Um, it should be good. And then, um, so now last time will be the last time, or in milliseconds, or uh, in, in, yeah, in, in, as a double, the last time that uh, anything happened. Um, so we can do um double now so we'll get the current now right so what time is the current right now uh glfw has that for us glfw get time yep get time um and you can see it returns the value of the glfw timer um unless it has been set using glfw set time measures the elapsed time since glfw was initialized that's fine that's great i don't care all i care about is the difference right so now the first difference is going to be huge because GLFW might take a long time to update or to initialize itself, right, uh, from this call. So what I can do is just do a quick, um, uh, yeah, I guess maybe it doesn't matter for the first frame. Um, like I could, I could, I could just do like last time equals GLFW get time here. Um, I guess it really doesn't matter. So this should be fine. We'll leave it like this. Um, so now is the current time. So now we can actually say dt our delta time is now minus the last time and last time is well hasn't been set yet so actually I guess we need to set it to something so yeah let's let's set it here let's say last time equals glfw get time we'll do this as close to the end of the construct of the initialized function as possible um, before we return so last time is something valid so then now is the current time so we'll say dt is the difference between now and the last time so how much time did it take? And again, the first frame is going to be a little bigger than, than the rest of the frames. Um, but we'll now have an actual delta time. Um, and then to set up the, the to set this up for the next frame so we can calculate it properly, we need to update last time. So we can say last time equals now. And the reason I cache now was for this reason, right? It was so I could cache now at the beginning of the frame. And the time that it takes for these two calls to be made is not going to play a factor in our delta time. It's all going to matter. So now we have our updated delta time is now minus last time, and then we'll update last time to now. So next time our update gets called, now is updated, obviously, now is the current time, and our last time is the previous time we got called. So now we have a differentiation of time here. We have a delta, uh, which we can now use uh, to actually position everything properly uh, and apply positioning and rotating and all of that stuff properly. Um, so we need that static method, right? So that void engine get dt and that's just going to return dt 
And again, I didn't want to make DT publicly accessible. Oh, geez. There we go. Sorry. Uh, so I didn't want to make DT publicly accessible because if, for whatever reason, some code somewhere else changes DT, our delta time is all messed up. So we get a gutter for it instead. Um, so now I have a publicly accessible or statically accessible delta time from our engine. So our sprite really should care about this. So every time we do something like move by, so move to is fine because you, it's, a, it's an absolute value. But anytime it's relative, something that can be called multiple times and it's supposed to be relying on the previous value of that, uh, whatever that is, uh, we need to set it move by needs to be, uh, or anything by needs to take the delta time into account. Um, so now I don't think I have engine, right? Because I haven't included it. So I should include engine up here. Uh, so let's include. Oh, geez. Um, and we'll do, for now, we'll just do dot dot slash engine. Uh, what we can do is set up our base engine function uh, folder as the root of a, of a um, header folder. Um, so that we can actually just say engine slash, just like we can with DLFW using these angle brackets. Uh, anyways, for now this is fine um, because the structure in here should never change because this is our, our engine code, right? Um, okay, so now we can we should be able to do this now. So um, we're gonna add x times engine get dt get the delta time. So we're gonna add that or should I multiply that to x? We're gonna multiply that to y, and the brackets here aren't actually necessary, uh, but I just like to be thorough and show it. Um, move left is fine. Or actually, no, it's not. Because look, it's relative, right? So minus equals speed. So our speed, again, might change based on how long the last frame took. So speed times engine get dt. Okay, same deal all the way through. Uh, so if we do this, it'll be easier to copy. Boom, boom, and boom. Rotate 2 is fine, rotate by is not. So again, it's relative. So we're rotating by x times engine get dt. And set scale is fine, so that's it. Okay, great. So now everything is actually working with our delta time from our engine. Um, so what you'll see is that speed is going to be super tiny now because delta time is usually a fraction, <laughs> yeah, a fraction of a of a second, like a millisecond or a couple milliseconds. Um, or even microseconds, like it depends on, on the size of your loop, right? But the point is that now our speed, it's going to move at this speed, regardless of the, the speed, or yeah, it's going to move at this rate, regardless of the speed of your computer, regardless of the speed of any other uh, factors that may associate to how fast your, the code can run on, on a particular machine. Um, so generally when you implement DT, speed needs to skyrocket. Um, so we'll set it to, let's say, 100. 100 seems like a valid number. And we'll give that a shot. Um, and there we go, 100. That's a little faster, but again, it's constant. And that's what matters. Regardless of the of how long a frame took, we can actually always guarantee that it's going to move at this rate on any machine on any at any point in time. It's going to move at this rate. So what's going to happen is, ah, yeah, that's a good way to show it. OK. Um, so for move right, I'm just going to say plus equals speed. Um, and I can show you how that actually changes. So speed obviously is huge now, right? So it's going to fly to the right. Um, let's make speed smaller so I can make my point. Um, speed can be something like 10. That, that's fine. 10 is good because you can really see it. So if you, if you oh, geez, what happened? Uh, try again. Weird. Okay. Um, all right. So if I move to the right, I'm not using delta time. I'm moving up just so you can see it. Um, so if I move to the right, I'm not using delta time. So if I move to the right, see how fast that's moving? It's moving to the left. Let me reset that. So again, delta time is how long a frame took. And just so happens that in Windows, when you when you're holding when you're dragging this window around, all the frames stop. Right? It, it, that that your loop is not running. It's paused until you let go. So all of that time that it took for us to let go accumulates in our delta time, right? Because we calculated the current time and our, the, the next frame hasn't been called yet. So if I move to the right, I'm going to move to the right and I'm going to hold this. I'm going to hold click this so I can move it around. 
and you'll see it stop moving so, while I maintain my D pressed. So boom, there, I held it, it's not moving anymore, but my, my uh, right is still pressed, so it should be moving. So as soon as I let go, you're going to see it's going to pick off right where, right where it left off, just like that, right? Whereas when I'm going left, when I'm actually accounting and accumulating delta time and accounting for it when I'm moving it, you can see it's moving at a constant rate. If I hold it and I wait a bit, you look at where it is now. Basically what's happening is our delta time is increasing. It's getting to a value greater than one. So we're going to move by a value greater than our speed for the next frame only. As soon as I let go, you see it snap to where it's supposed to be and then it continues. So obviously that's an exaggerated um, way to show it, but it's, it's a way to show it, right? Every, anytime there is a slight fluctuation in the delta time for any, for any reason, um, your sprite is still going to be where the user expects it to be. It's going to move at the same rate because we're accounting for delta time, um, which is a big concept in games. And there we go. Now we've implemented it. It's very simple. It's just the delta time, right? Um, so let's put that back in. Um, let's put this back up to 100 and we'll put this back in. And we should be good to go. So now we've got uh, good position, good movements, and we can still, oh yeah. So, so yeah, so we're again rotating by delta time. So our rotate is actually very small now. Actually, I wonder how about a middle peak rotate. Even that's fairly slow, right? Uh, and again, it's because it's get it's our rotation value multiplied by like 0 0.01 or, or 0 0.1, depending on how long it took the frame to go. Um, so there it is, very slow, uh, which is fine. We can bump that up a bit. Um, I just hard coded that in here, right? Yeah, ten. So we make it a hundred. So now, okay. So now, as you notice, though, this is no longer degrees, right? This is actually um, just an arbitrary value. It's it's a rotate. It's a rotate speed, right? Uh, it's a speed of rotation as opposed to an actual absolute rotation, um, which is fine. We we can we can handle that. We can deal with that. So now everything's 100. Uh, it's going to move by at or at that speed. Uh, and if I hold it, it's going to move at 100 times the delta time. And that is our rotation speed. Um, so there we go. That's, uh, that's pretty much it, I think, for today. Um, next time, what we could do is uh, go a little further here in terms of the math. So I think what we'll do next time is we'll center this. So it rotates. The, the middle point is actually about the middle of the spray. Um, and we can work on like, for example, right now the, the sprite is facing up. So if I wanted to move forward, right now I have a move left, move right, right, left, right, up, down. But if I want forward, it should be moving something like this, right? And as I rotate it, it should now move like something like this with a slight up angle, right? So we can do something like that next time. Um, and maybe even, I don't know, I, I see something like, honestly, I see something like a Flappy Bird style game right now, just because we have a plane and... It rotates kind of like Flappy Bird does. Um, so maybe for the first game, we can just make a Flappy Bird clone. And that should be that get, that has uh, rotation, that has a very specific type of input, a very simple one, but a very specific one. Um, it has its physics, right? So we need to add gravity. We need to add um, velocity because when you when you fly upwards, you don't. Well, I guess it, it's kind of uh, actually no, it does. Yeah, it does use physics. If your bird is like dropping really fast and you press the space bar and you tap the phone, it goes up, but it's going to, it's going to rotate up uh, by a less amount than if you were already moving up. Um, so it is, it is physics. So we can do that. And then we can do um, uh, bounding box. Actually, we'll probably use a different algorithm that I can explain later um, for collisions and we can have game state. We can have menu. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so yeah, let's let's do that. So that'll be kind of the first game we'll make here. Then uh, we'll be a Flappy Bird clone with a menu and everything. So you can actually who we can do. We can cover game state. We can cover physics. We can cover collision. We can cover um, a very specific style of game. Um, and I think that'll be good to start because that'll be it's a simple game to make and it goes through a lot of the fundamentals. Um, if you guys have other ideas, other games you guys might want to make instead. Like if everyone here hates Flappy Bird and you want to make something else, let me know. Uh, send me a message, whatever, write a comment. Um, just let me know because it's uh, it's valid what all of these are are going to, you know, what, what we're going to end up making here. Um, so I think we're good. Let me check uh, comments real quick. Uh, Grass Helmet, are these being uploaded on YouTube or somewhere? Yes, they are. Um, there is a link underneath uh, the video. If you scroll down, you should see on the info panel on the right side.
where to find the code and cash streams and there's a YouTube link right there that is where I'm caching the stream so there is uh, the first one's already up on there this one will be up on there I guess tonight or tomorrow um, and all of the subsequent streams will just be cached over there as well um, so yes you can see them they are down there they're also um, uh, uh, the github link is also there so at the end of the stream I'm gonna post upload whatever we have now to github just to update that um, so that in case anybody missed a couple streams or they just want to come get up to date with where we are for the next stream they can just pull the code um, so unless anybody else has any more questions I think we're good to go um, I think that was good we got a lot of input stuff done mouse and keyboard we can do joystick too uh, I, I realized we didn't cover joystick but not everyone has like gamepad like I do have a 360 controller that I hook up that I, we can do in GLFW um, and maybe I'll do that like not as a stream, but I can do it as a side video, just a side tutorial, just to set that up because it doesn't apply to everyone. So I don't want to, I don't want to force anybody to sit through watching setting that up. Um, so yeah, if you if you if you want to do joystick, just let me know and I'll make a video for it and I'll upload it to YouTube separately. So it's not part of kind of this. It'll be like episode two point five or whatever, but um, at least it'll be it'll be of value to some people. Um, so yeah, doesn't look like anybody else has any questions. So um, that's where I'll end off, guys. So thanks for watching. Um, again, if you are just joining us now and um, it's fairly late, but um, you will be able to find these on YouTube. Uh, we'll be cached there. Uh, code will be up on GitHub soon. And I will see you guys all next week. All right. Take care, guys.